I, I hope my voice will last out all evening, all afternoon. I have a glass of water. For the record, I've taken off the treasurer's badge of office. And I can assure you, I won't be offering myself the ex expenses at the end of the talk, <laughs> which is my usual duty on these occasions. So I'll start by saying a little bit about myself and the environment in which we, we worked at Queen Mary. I hope the, I say the uh, observant of you will have noticed the deliberate juxtaposition in the title. Because I talk about the ICT 1900 range, and then I talk about the, the ICL 1905E, because there were, there's quite a lot of history in that, and, and why the, the two things are not exactly the same. So, how to move on here? That's it. A very quick overview of me. I started reading mathematics in 66, Queen Mary, but I ended up with a degree in mathematics with computer science. And the with is a technical term, meaning I had less than 50% of course units. Because in my first year, I learned to program in ALGO 60 using the London Atlas. And that was taught to us on the computational methods part one. In the second year, we were taught how to program the 1900 in PLAN, which stands for Program Language 1900, very original name. And that was in computational methods two. And sometime early in 68, what had originally been the mathematical laboratory, which was where the paper tape link, the atlas was, was replaced by a new structure with a computer center for service delivery and an academic computer science department. It was split in two and to be quite honest, they hardly ever spoke to each other again from that day onwards, but that was largely to do with personalities, I fear. Around Easter 68, the ICL 1905E was delivered. But having discovered the, the great fun of programming in 1900, that summer I got a temporary job in the computer centre. I wrote the student registration suite for the for the BSC course unit range in that summer, which I then had to use myself to register for my third year, which was quite amusing. As you might probably guess, we didn't attempt the exam results system until the year after. <coughs> Starting my third year, I then switched from, from maths to every course unit I could do in computer science, which was mostly taught by the late, great Peter Landin, which was extremely interesting. And then in June 69, I joined the computer center as full-time system programmer the morning after my last final exam. I needed the money. <laughs> and he, about a year later, we started the, the development of the Maximop system. So that's a very brief overview. For those who don't know the place, that's Queen Mary College, a large campus strung out along the Mile End Road. That's, that's, that's the old building of the, of, of the East London College. Building doesn't actually appear, unfortunately, the way I've arranged these bits. That was the old people's palace, which acted as a theatre and meeting hall. And down the road, 
this was in the 1960s, the latest building on the campus was the, the mathematics building of which the whole of the top floor, if you look carefully, you can see there are almost no windows. The whole of the top floor was the computer center. And there's a couple of shops inside of the, that one I think is, is 5E because the cabinets are low in relation to the memory cabinets. This shot, as you can see, there are a pair of consoles. By then it was, we, we, we had a pair of 1904 S's in there. So what I'm gonna talk about, I've divided it up into chunks. First bit I'm gonna talk about the hardware architecture of the 1900s from a programmer's perspective. This is not from an engineer perspective or anything. This is this is what a programmer sees in the machine. I'll then do do the same for the operating systems architecture as a systems programmer, rather as Bill had mentioned, applications programmers would not see most most of that, and that leads fairly naturally into the decision of how we coped with those. How do we call them features when we needed to design the Maximop system to replace the Minimop? Now, I'm not going to go into very great detail about some of that because I wrote an article that was published in Resurrection 11 years ago. I can't believe it was that long, but <laughs> which went into some detail on that. But I realized afterwards from some of the comments that. People who are not familiar with the innards of the 1900 range found some of that rather technical and, and sort of arbitrary arguments without a theoretical base. So that's why I badge this as a prequel. This is the, the tutorial which should allow you to understand that article better. So I would urge you all after this to go back and reread it. And then I'll, I'll give a little bit about the further reading and resources, and we can have, have some questions. So part one, the hardware architecture, the programmer's perspective. All right. Just trying to get that so it gives me the right. And I still can't lose this bit at the top. Can we do anything else with it? Hide? I can't see a hide anywhere. No, don't do an X like that. Probably. No, I can't see a hide. Never mind. So, right. So, fortunately, it's deliberately hiding the title from you at the moment. I called it the little machine that grew. The ICT 1900 range, as originally designed and built, they brought it over from Ranty Packard in Canada. It had 24-bit words, which meant you could you could hold integers up to plus or minus 8.3 million. It was a two complement machine, which was not still not universal in those days in the early 60s the words were also split into four six-bit characters the character set was basically what's often known as the fortran alphabet that's just the uppercase alphabet in numbers and some basic punctuation marks but an immediate problem with the architecture Although you could pack four characters into a word, there was no way to directly access those characters in the instruction set. You, you, you had to use what ICL called modification, which I think other people call indexing, to actually extract individual characters from the words. It's very much a word-based machine. Um, a normal instruction, I've just put up how the 24 bits are allocated, the standard instruction step set, three bits for, for the X register or accumulators, seven bit function code, 
a two bit field for the modifier and a 12 bit, bit operand. Um, slight variation. All, all the branching instructions have a slightly different format. Function codes were all even, so they only needed six bits. And then there was a 15 bit address in the rest. I mean, there were the eight 24 bit registers called X0 to X7, but there were also word zero to word seven in, in, in every program space. But, but only the three of them, X1, 2, and 3, could actually be used as index registers, because there was only two bits for the modifier field, which compared with something like an IBM 360 is extremely restrictive, where you, where you have 16 registers and they could all be indexing. So, of course, this means if you've done sums that these machines they can only directly address the first 4k words of memory in 12 bits and even with modifiers on with the index registers you can only use 32k with 15 bits which again in the early 60s when that was designed and launched that was quite a powerful machine and of course, that was not to last. I talk about what made it fairly nice from the programmer's perspective. There was a very comprehensive instruction set. You could do memory to register, register to memory. You got every permutation of load, add, negate, subtract. And there was a multi-length variable variant of every instruction so you could do multi-length arithmetic or and the hardware dealt with the carry and everything for you so there which was probably what the applications program has used you could do double length or longer if you wanted to i know sort of people did everything in pence i remember in payroll everything thing was actually done in pence and something that as a programmer i thought was an extremely useful feature the character values naught to nine were the binary values naught to nine mm -hmm. i was shocked when i found that that other machine architectures had the digits yes. up at octal 30 i mean what a stupid way to do it <laughs> because that made it very easy to to do conversions and all sorts sorts of things I've just put up a few very simple little examples of plan, plan programming language here to give you the flavor. So the first little example you do, load register number four, the contents of value one, you could add the number direct operand the number 10 and store it back in another you could so that was a very brief example of double length arithmetic here you load the two halves of a 48-bit word subtract another 48-bit word from it you notice the first of those uses the hardware carry feature to go for double length you could and i think compilers usually put, put the ldxc on for the first one because it does if it's a well-formed number it does absolutely nothing it's totally re redundant and then you could do other there's another example you could just load a number and subtract it straight into a stored variable so you've got every permutation like that a brief view the, the two series of programming manuals we had the original 1900 range which i think was was you notice that is the ict format 
And then after the restructuring, it became the ICL format. Very brief, just the top of the order code list, all the instructions, load, add, negate, subtract, do them all again with carry, store, add, negate, subtract, do them all again with carry, all complete set of the logical operations and or exclusive or, one little thing I obey, loads of branch instructions, branch on zero, non-zero, branch negative, branch positive. Some interesting instructions there I'll come back to later. Call, exit, jump, test, overflow, test, carry, and more sophisticated machines with hardware floating point. The early machines had software floating point. You could you could do, do, do branching on the state of the floating point register. And then down here at the bottom, you see again, the whole set of instructions again, this time with the with the direct operands with the N instead of, of the X there. So let's have another really nice features. For data, you divide a word up into up into a counter modifier pair. So the first nine bits was a counter, and the bottom 15 bits was the pointer. That one word use it to define a table or a record or a buffer. And then there are a set of instructions that allow you to work along it from that definition. And there's a very simple example again in in plan, find the table length to be 10, allocate a lower memory table of that length. And then in the program area, you could load the counter, which puts the number up in the top nine bits. And then you can just do a loop. Moving up at using this magic instruction, branch on unit indexing, which incremented the modifier which incremented the modifier, decremented the counter and looped until, until the counter exhausted. Thus, you could, you could fill, copy, clear, quite big tables and records in very, very tight coding loops, which was rather important when, when most users couldn't afford even a 32K bit machine. Or a word machine. Then if there was a more sophisticated development of that. You could have a character counter modifier where the counter shrunk seven bits and the character index, which was now the thing that points to which character in the word, which effectively you have the definition of a string word a string of up to 128 characters and then you could do a lot of very neat and tidy analysis okay to buffer 80 characters or 20 words loop through it you load the character by the index do what you like with it looking for a terminator or the first comma or stripping the spaces and now you can use the branch on character indexing which is one of the more complex machines, which increments the, the character index. If, if, that, if that produces a carry, the modifier goes up, and it decrements the counter and loops. So you can scan up the whole of the, of the string or the array or the character buffer, whatever it is. And again, in very tight, short, fast loops. Just very brief word about the compilers, consolidators, loaders. I should have left a much bigger top margin, shouldn't I, on these slides? All the compilers, including plan, output semi compiled segments in an absolutely common format. So you could mix Algol, Fortran, COBOL, plan. You could write. A lot of people would 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 write the program in Fortran, but some subroutines in Plan. Get speed and power out of, out of the machines. I think all the consolidator, which other architectures will call linker, 
which would take the semi-compiled segments pull in the libraries and produce a loadable binary program to anything you liked tape cards mag tape or disc or there was also a lovely thing called the console loader which was basically the same process but it only used a, a, a scratch file and did the disappearing trick of overwriting it itself with the executable program very useful in a test environment where you were redoing it every 15 minutes but there were some downsides again giving away the old small architecture of the machine binary images were stored in really quite small blocks even on mag tape 512 words was the biggest block you could have of binary and there was red tape and checksums wrapped around all that which actually meant that to load a program into memory took surprising length of time and a lot of cpu many programs we quickly discovered took longer to load than they did to execute because of this so and the same applied program overlays programs all had to be overlaid because because we were always so short of memory and the overlays took forever to climb in memory because effectively the block would have, have to be read into a buffer the the checksums tested and then the binary copied into its execution position which was slow and sluggish but there was wonderful range compatibility again unlike some of icl's competitors unless you use something very exotic it was almost impossible to write an application program that would not run on absolutely every machine in range the, all all the main instruction set behaved identically from a 1901 to a 1909 which was again i think a very in those days a very good feature but let's look at the restrictions you get and how you extend it i've already talked about this you can only have a 12-bit direct opera then 15-bit modified or a 15-bit branch address so a typical program some reserved words down at the bottom which includes the registers the program count and it's just all the floating mm -hmm. point register and some things then what was known as the the lower data area that's all the data below the 4k threshold which the instructions could all access directly then you would have your instructions because they can all be up in the 15-bit area and you'd have the upper data which you cannot directly access you can only get there by by using modifier by using an index register and what makes it all work is that every program runs in a little virtual space because there are two high-speed hardware registers the datum register that says that gives you a virtual word zero and oh. limit register that says how big you are and the hardware will not let you get out of those two boundaries however hard you try there is a major security feature of this 1900 architecture a program could not get out out its cage whatever it tried to, to do and again that was actually pretty advanced for the age but just to summarize that it's a small machine 32k words program and data space and, but that is all you could have on the first generation of 1900s the ones that came out on the ice now that's the machines that were just a number 1901 right up to 1909 although i think in those days there wasn't a six or seven or eight because that was what was i suspect subsequently called compact mode 
both 15-bit address mode and direct branch mode. So, and at this time, although we at Queen Mary had got a brand new shiny 5E, significance which I'll come to on the next slide or two, most of our fellow 1900 universities had all really got 1904s, 1905s, and what I know ICL sales rather naughtily called the University Jubilee Jam Paris box, the 1909, which was one that had British standards interfaces on it, connecting to the laboratory equipment and things. All those were fully compact machines that could not be extended. And so that was a consideration because it wasn't only us at Queen Mary who were unhappy the limitations. Every user group meeting you went to, there'd be 40 people there complaining about the same res res restrictions. So things had to move on. And roughly to do with the time when it changed to be ICL, I don't think there's actually any causal connection there, but it's, it's a coincidence that the the E and F series machines came out. E standing for extended and F for extended with fast hardware floating point. I think extended precision floating point as well, but again, I'm not sure about that at that time. Because as a systems programmer, I never did any floating point, couldn't, couldn't understand what it was for. That was for the Fortran programmers. Now in extended mode, the modifiers could now use up to 22 bits. And I cannot remember how many how many that is. That's okay. uh, plus or minus four meg. Yes, yes, four meg. But immediately that means all the very clever counter modifiers, the character counter modifiers. I was waxing about for efficiency and ease of use. It don't work anymore because there is no room for the counter in extended mode. All it's got left are the top two bits to be the character index. So all that stopped working in extended mode. And now to do the same, the loops, I haven't bothered to show you, but you can guess those tight, efficient little coding loops I gave you examples of, now needed second register to count in and extra instructions in loop. So to do the identical thing in extended mode could double the size of the modular code and halve its execution speed. And in fact, in extended mode, the instructions took slightly longer because of the of, of the longer carry ripple on, on the address field. So that was an interesting salvation of the range, but it came with a penalty. I'll briefly mention there was also a thing called extended branch mode. Now, I confess, I never used it. We didn't have a use for it. But that said, if you switch to extended branch mode, the 15 bit address field became a signed 14 bit bit offset from the current instruction, which meant you could either do relative or you could go via a register and do what's called a replaced indirect branch, which meant you could either have a locatable, relocatable chunk of code, which is essential for the paging systems that came along later, or you could have code above the 32K boundary if you could afford that much hardware to help ease the programmer's pain there were a few extra instructions added in the extended range a branch on count which is what you use to replace the, 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 the counter modifier instructions and a move character but frankly the timing 
the move character, which basically took a pair of string IDs and copied it character by character, was not a lot faster than than the than the four instruction compact mode loop itself was. So, but and there was now a branch on floating point because by this stage, every machine had floating point hardware. All the earlier things, like a nineteen oh one, two, three, and four. In fact, I remember rightly, the nineteen oh one and two did not even even allow floating point instructions. The three and the four offered it you a microcode and very slow. It was the E's and F's which actually offered it in hardware. And there was a very strange instruction called a supplementary modifier. But it didn't behave like a base register instruction in some other architectures, because it, it didn't actually remember anything, only for one instruction. So if you, if you wanted to say, I've got this big upper table in memory, Here's the pointer to it. Use a supplementary modifier to point to the base, and then you could still use the ordinary index in that table. You had to put the SMO in in front of every instruction, which not as helpful as you might think it was. I do think that was possibly a place where the hardware designers had never had never actually write a program. Luckily, from my perspective anyway, address mode and branch mode were independent of each other. You can have either, neither or both, and you can switch them on and off as you executed, which made a difference. So that's all I'm going to talk about, the actual hardware architecture. So let's look at what that manifests itself in the operating systems. Okay. The operating system, which again, I'll read it out to you as you can't see it there, was EXEC, Multi-Programming Operators Executive. Here it is, Sunday name. And there were the E6 series, which ran on all the West Gorton machines, which was 1904 upwards, and e the E3 series that ran on all the Stevenage machines, which were 1903 downwards. And they were, originally they were the BM, which stood for batch monitor. And later they were tuned up and were called real time monitor because they, they, they could actually do interrupts and things. But in practice, the processors ran simple mode flip flop, exec mode, which interrupts were enabled and the whole hardware was addressed in absolute terms by the exec code or program mode using the data and limit registers in your little the relative addressing in a program space and also once you've done that the programs had a relative priority to each other managed by executive exec also did we called extra codes, which other people call service calls. All the 150 and 160 group of instructions were just the way you talk to exec. You could allocate a peripheral forward and IO transfer. You could give and in fact give and get information to and from exec. Give me the date, give me the time. Give me another 4K of memory, all sorts of things like that. You could suspend and wait, and print the little message on the operator's console, halted, XX or whatever you put in the code. And there was a lovely little instruction that actually predated its, its, its utility, in a sense predated even George II. The delete and type, you could end your program with with the delta instruction, which actually typed the next operator's command out of your, your string. So typically things like a compiler 
would finish with the with the instruction delete and type find hash link and you go straight on and start consolidating and you would pass the file name across in registers because if you did a delta find you got the same registers into the other program so you could daisy chain them but in a sense that didn't mean anything after we we got things like george two because you you would do it in the jcl anyway so you didn't really need that but it was a, a lovely little inst instruction days of your exec managed everything to do with the peripherals and to do with files but a very powerful not very well advertised or known facility was executive would allow what were known as sub multiple execution threads within the same address space so your, your one program space would have up to three different threads running in it at the same time each with its own relative priority and these were known as zero program name because all 1900 programs have a four name which is which is how exec referred to them so we had zero hash one hash member zero member one and so on and there was the concept of the trusted program there were three levels of trusted program q r and s which did more you could do more and more things in collaboration with with exec so to summarize that diagrammatically when when the processor was running in exec mode however big you were be you compact or extended exec is sitting at the bottom over the interrupt vectors and everything and then you load lots of programs up above and you have a bit of spare memory and when you're running in exec mode you absolutely address the whole machine when you when exec starts a program it activates the datum and limit register and now just that program is running and if an interrupt occurs machine draws straight back into exec mode if the program issues an extra code that in itself takes you straight back into exec mode and then exec deals with it and restarts the program if it wants to or picks another program instead so that's how they time shared i think it's true not very personal to my talk the very early very small machines had a datum register but they didn't actually have a limit the limit was always a physical end of the memory and were known as single programming ops execs i think that if you'd only got 4k words all together in 1901 you couldn't actually have any more than that so talk a little bit about the the, the the disk formats this is something that again is a call back into the eons of time there were eds fours four billion characters our original disks they doubled the density to eds8 then EDS 30s, and finally we had EDS 60s, 60 million characters. I mean to say, you'd laugh at a PC with 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 that much storage today, but that's how it was. The first cylinder of the disk, head position zero of the physical hardware, contained the system control area which gave every file a name of exactly 12 characters, uppercase only, a generation number, and said which, which cylinders and block bits of the disk were allocated to this file. But all files could only be opened at the physical level. You opened a file, which was just a chunk of binary disk, divided up into 128 word blocks, although, there was an interesting facility that you could access those as either one, two, four, or eight block the logical bucket. Now, I must confess, I never quite understood what real advantage that was. It did make a few things a little bit easier to do. But to be honest, 
using multi-block pockets for most applications was, was basically just noise. It made no difference. You, you could have done it all in one block anyway, and perhaps been, been slightly simpler, but, but you could also do seek area. That is everything you can do without moving the disk heads. You could transfer the whole cylinder in a single IO call, which was sometimes known as a sheet transfer. That was where you got the speed out of the disk drives, not by, 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 by getting the 128 word blocks off it. You got that by getting the whole cylinder, which could be, God, I'm trying to think how big they could go on EDS 60s. They were, how big was the seek area? 270 blocks, I think. But Perhaps more fundamentally, there was no concept of file ownership in, in, in exec, and no concept of the user identity. Exec owned everything. The operator at the console owned everything. There was no concept of file security at all. You, you could open any file and you could do anything you liked with it. There was so as a result of that, there was no equivalent of a user directory, a DIR facility from exec. The nearest you could get to it was the first level of a trusted program was allowed to read the system control area. So it could, it could compile its own directory of files on that disk. But that was all you could do. And that has some huge constraints for a multi user system. And the other thing that be a further consequence of that, and I said, you open physical files, a bare binary block of disk. So any internal subfile or record structure of a file was entirely program dependent. Exec had no involvement whatsoever in that. But there were range standards published in the programmer's reference manual about how to lay out files and subfiles, how to lay out records. And most things followed them. You didn't have to. And some people didn't for various things. And in fact, we didn't in Maximum. So just looking how trusted program works, one of the things a trusted program can do, it can run another program called a program under control affectionately known as the puck and so you could run a program cooperatively with exec exec would in, would intercept all the extra codes and immediately hand it back to the trusted program and said say what do you want me to to do with this extra code and you could either give it back to exec and say you do it as if i did it or you could just do it yourself which is how maximop minimop these things actually had a user file store because when when user program said read a card image the instruction came back to a trusted program like george or maximop and that would say ah i'll give you this this line of data out of my file instead of that card image and that was how it all works so there's a little map of how a trusted program works so as before execs at the bottom of the machine various programs in store but if one of them is a trusted program tp it could now say to exec here's this block of my memory treat it as a program in its own right and exec would switch the the the, the data and submit registers to it and that's how you time share users and as soon as Okay, you can switch it to another bit. And that is enormously powerful. In fact, as we used to, to joke, with very little extra effort, and I think we did do it on one or two specialist things we did, the program under control could actually run another program if you were happy to cooperate with it. So you could have 
a puck puck. And we used to laugh about how deeply you could nest these these things. Imagine it would have brought the machine to a standstill and you'd have <laughs> run out of the memory in no time at all. But so that's the framework, the hardware, the operating systems of range. Now we needed to mention we started running the Minimop system, which stands for miniaturized multiple programming, which supported nine users on a nine channel multiplexer, the seven double oh something or other. Seven double oh seven. Another nine channel multiplexer, which could handle nine hundred and ten boat teletypes. And that was all the Minimop could do. And it was a shambles. One, it wasn't actually reliable, but even when it was, it was so inefficient. It thrashed about. It tried to run one user program. When that program stopped to do something, it would copy the whole thing out to disk, then copy another program into disk, start to run it. The, 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 the program would go 50 instructions and issue a disk transfer. So it now stopped to have a think about that and copied it all out to disk again and want a different program in. And it just plunked, was the phrase. Very poor performance. Not helped by the fact that I mean, I haven't mentioned very early days. Our computer sci scientists started to teach interactive computing on an ICL system called Gene, which was a lightweight interactive maths program, which it, which just ran the multiplexer itself and behaved as if you 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 had a set of nine smart teletypes that, that could do formulas and, and small stored programs, a bit like very early basic, but it was purely active. Now that ran entirely in memory and was actually jolly good. You had nine, nine users on it, you could teach nine students how to program in this stuff in real time, didn't affect the batch streams, hardly used any CPU, not a vast amount of memory, and was really slick. You ran Gene under, under the Minimop, and so you now had, if you try to do the, the same lesson, you had nine complete copies of Gene, the which were swapped in and out on, on and off the, the, the disks every time a user pressed a key practically. Which you might ground to a standstill, and that 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 the juxtaposition of going from an an all in the memory teaching tool to one that's entirely disk based was oh, Professor Isaac Barza, who was then the director of the computer center as well as the head of computer science just threw up his hands in horror and said i cannot teach like this i've registered 30 students for september they couldn't even time share the, the nine teletypes in a sensible manner so we had to do something so we said we can do better and as I briefly mentioned earlier, we were not the only university thinking about this, but we probably by fluke, I think, I'm sure it was, was fluke, not, not really good management, but that, that might be unfair. We did have the resources. We had a small systems programming team and some, and some rather bright guys. And we said, we can do better than this. So we, 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 we managed to get the source code of Minimop out of ICL. And we, it was written in plan. And it was dreadful. Hardly commented. It's, they tried to be clever and put 
some of the code in the lower memory, but then the compiler gives you a compiler error on every line in case it is address overflow. So you actually, when you look at a listing, you cannot tell the good instructions from the bad. They've all got error codes against them. That is very unmaintainable. And we, we so we, our original idea was we just find the bottlenecks and fine tune it. Our idea of doing that lasted about a week, I think. No way. Let's start again. But we laid down some rules. It was not the programming team laying this down. This was the computer center management and the teaching establishment. Because by now we'd already got about 30 users of the Minimop, each with their own user file. And we, although we still only had a nine channel multiplexer, we, 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 we had a manual plug switchboard in front of it. So we had about 30 odd lines coming into the computer center. And if you wanted to use the computer, you phoned up and said, I'd like a port, please. And you were plugged in. So the 30 teletypes scattered all over the college, and in fact, some down the road in the London hospital places, managed to share these, these, these nine ports. So, so we have to do better. So it must be fully minimum compatible and interchangeable. Because again, we naively believed ICL would have to do something about minimum and come up with a better version. Skilly, weren't we? It must use the existing and preserve the minimop files so we could run maximop on these user files and then switch back to minimop. So we might have sessions in the evening and so on. So we obviously we didn't want to re-educate. It had been enough trouble to teach them in the first place. So we had to mirror the minimop command language and all its facilities, which to be honest, were not very extensive. But then you mind the other things I talked about, we knew we needed to minimize the CPU and the memory, because although we'd got a big high speed 5e with with 64 a words of memory on it, that still didn't go very far with, with a, a couple of big Fortran programs slogging away in, in George 2 taking up every large CPU cycle that was that was offered to them. And these uh, half a dozen or, or more people were trying to use Minimop system interactively, we were desperately short CPU cycles and storage. So we had to be really tight. It had to be very small because we must continue to run the batch jobs in the background and the over and we had to minimize the system's overheads which meant we had to overlay everything. Remember I'd mentioned that overlays were darn inefficient in the way they worked. So the other criteria, we had to use to support a lot more, a lot more than Minimop's nine users, which immediately means if you've got nine users with a user file each, that's fine, you can have nine files open at once. In the trusted program but if you want to run 30 users you can't have 30 files open at once exec only allows 32 for the whole system so you can't do that so we refined nicknamed the um Rilla file system and I, i'm not convinced we invented it i have a feeling one of the other universities actually invented it. We borrowed it from them. But I, I can't actually prove that now. That the way exec managed the system control areas of the disks had no consistency checks. So with a clever trusted program, you could you could allocate a zero length file and then go in and change the system control area to say this file actually is the whole disk. And hey presto, now by opening one file, you can access every other file on that disk. All you have to do is to work out where the, the blocks are. And that's actually quite easy for a trusted program 
directory the the directory so we open the big file over the umbrella that way the boundary of how many files can you ever want completely vanishes because there could in theory be thousands of users all getting at their respective bits of disk inside this one big file we just manage all the the we, we, we just put a mapping function in for the block numbers. That turned out to be essential. We knew the system to cooperate with the other 1900 universities. It had to be customizable. As, as I mentioned earlier, many of our friends and colleagues were now stuck with a compact only mode 1905 or 1909 that could only run in the 15 bit address mode we could run in the as we had a big shiny 5e we could run our system in extended mode but if we used extended mode in, in instructions it would immediately not work on the compact mode processes so we decided that i remember I talked about the fact that in, you could do faster coding in the compact mode. Well, let's make our system work in compact mode. And one of the, again, rather unpublicized features of executive, and I don't know whether it was a design intention or an accident. When you run, you, you ran in the multi the multi-threaded sub-programming mode, each each thread could choose its own address mode. So this gave us the very powerful tool. So just explain where we got to. We decided we were not going to write the system in plan. We would use the language called chin, which depending on, on which user manual you read, I stands for a George input or or George initiation. I think it. I think some somebody renamed it at some point. A very powerful absolute address macro assembler, but it looks like plan to the ordinary reader. Unless you dive very deeply into it, you don't realise it's not a plan program, but it's powerful because instead of writing semi-compiled segment that the consolidator will merge with other things and put somewhere you're not quite sure where now you say i want this word in that address of that overlay absolute straight in which meant you can use you can write the executable binary output straight onto disk in huge contiguous blocks and so you can you can fast load a raw binary overlay in a single disk transfer and that makes it very res responsive you put your overlay file on the fastest device you've got and later on we actually we we managed to get a high-speed drum and we put the overlays on the high-speed drum and it was like having them in extended memory after that. Mm -hmm. Huge difference in the performance. Just excuse me for a second. So that was our design decision. The first thing we did, most unlike a bunch of system programmers, we sat down and wrote ourselves a comprehensive directory of systematic variable namings and constant namings so we could we could share all the constants in the system between lots of different bits of the system everybody there would only be one if we needed if we needed a constant with bit nine set in it cb9 was a universal constant that every 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 programmer inside that system could use and you never duplicated anything. That saved a lot of space and accidents, misunderstanding. We decided 
a balance. We would let the compiler do as much of the configuration work as was practical, because a gin had a wonderful command called hash skip. And you could either give it a pair of brackets and it would, if the, if the Boolean on the skip line was false, it just left out that bunch of code, or you could put hash skip in front of a hash segment and it left out the segment. So we can leave out all the code we didn't need for our configuration. Which explain the significance of that. Things like different types of terminal, the site customizations for other universities and a few commercial users. We could just skip an extra bit. We didn't carry a single word of overhead in our runtime system, nor did they when they compiled it for the right configuration. But at the same time, we wanted to make as many dynamic tuning and performance installation parameters as we could. There were things like the number of simultaneous users and programs allowed, the I.O. and the disk pools, the length of user time slots, all those sorts of things which could be tuned from day to day. So we had we had a slightly difficult balance of, of, of compiling streamlined configuration that didn't have any redundant code for any particular instance. At the same time, having as many things parametric and variable as we could get away with. That was quite, there were some interesting common room debates about one or two of those things. So, how did we go about it? The actual structure of the Maximop system. We would have a very smart setup room that will build an optimized runtime configuration. Remember, I just said we will let the compiler generate us an optimized code configuration. We will then have a, a smart setup routine that builds us an optimized runtime configuration with the right number of users, the right amount of memory, the right number of buffers, and so on. And we would run as three subprogram members. Member zero, the lowest priority. I say the lowest priority, it actually ran at 95, which for most application program purposes is near to infinity but we ran at 95. the primary role of member zero is to run the user pops it was heavily overlaid because we needed an overlay for every possible extra code every possible file action and so on that any user program could do it alone would do the interactions with ex with the operators and with exec because one of the slight little downsides of having this nice fast channel to ask exec to do things for you is it suspends you while it does it. Even though, so if you type a 20 character message on the operator's console, you're suspended for five or six seconds while, it, while you join the IOQ on the console to start, until your message starts typing, you can't res resume execution. Not a good idea for a real time system. So we said only zero hash can be suspended by exec. So everything that could that could cause you to be hung up will only be done in member zero. And because we, we want lots of big user programs, M0 will run in extended address mode. So we can we can have 40, 50, 60k of memory in total. The one hash to MMA, I might add, this was our internal programming. All our programs started Q for Queen Mary, Maximop Suite, Maximop itself, QMMA. We then had QMMB for the second system and so on. We, we had a systematic program naming convention, as well as everything else. Member one ran at medium priority, 97 normally. Always in compact mode only. Many overlays, because every different command you could type on the console had to have a different overlay. And some commands like 
nested macro execution would be half a dozen overlays. That would manage all the user activity threads, the data input, listing, subfile management, program control, user macros. And later, we even moved the editor that used to be a program into the overlays, which again took a naught off the editor's response time with, with the built-in editor. And it also managed the buffer pools. And member two, highest priority, that ran at 98, always in compact mode again, but did just and all of the communications handling, whether they were teletypes, VDUs, front-end processors, comms manager, whatever. It did no disk transfers and it could not be overlaid. So this was the hierarchy within system. Just carrying on from that, we talked about, I mean, that. Other little rules we made in the design, all overlays and all fixed data will be in the lower memory. So we could have fast direct access from, from everywhere to it. All permanent runtime code and all of the member one overlays had to be pure code. So they could multi-thread without being swapped. Even thought, and I think we were actually wrong. We thought because of the nature of what member zero's overlays were doing, extra code interpretation and interface with exec, they it would not be efficient to have them as pure code in any way. They'd always need to be reloaded every time. With hindsight, I think we could have also made them pure without very much extra effort. But never mind. The members would only communicate with each other through Nuth style semaphores, because Nuth was the flavor of the day in, in, in computer science in the 60s. So we, we used the Nuth semaphores to pass messages and IO buffers about within the system. And some, in some ways, slightly doubting our own ability, we needed a comprehensive post-mortem routine that would allow us to analyze everything that had gone wrong when it crashed and an absolutely fail-safe tidy up and, and, and fast restart mechanism. Because we assumed that our best efforts would not produce a system that was any more reliable than Minimop system, which fell over every couple of hours. We were wrong. But never mind, I wrote a fantastic post-mortem routine. <laughs> so there's the schematic map of, of the Maximop, the, the image of the trusted program that Maximop ran in. The very bottom of the memory was a little a fixed bootstrap, a 128 word program that the ops could load in the morning. It would sit there at the bottom of memory and, and wait until it was told to bring the system up. Completely configuration independent. We never changed that bootstrap for about a decade whilst we'd actually written it to work. All member zeros overlays, I said they had to be in the lower memory. 256 words, that was pretty generous in those days. All the member one overlays, sat next, then all the rest of the fixed, the lower data and memory. And all that had to be below the 4K threshold. Then we put the permanent, the code areas for the three members, and then the, the, the dynamic upper tables, the buffer pools, and so on, which all had to fit below the 32K boundary, because remember the two main members are running in compact mode. But then, the extended mode bit on the top that only member zero can actually use space to put in not one user program, several. And I think we normally ran with four areas and we tuned it so that all the small utility programs fitted in a single area. You can have up to four of them in memory at once and switch between them. And the huge compilers 
never took more than three. So however big a compiler you've got in memory, you'd still have room to put a utility alongside it. And we played with that over the, over the years and as the workload. So that was the overview. I'll just give you the really frightening one of starting with this diagram. I thought, no, 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 you don't want <laughs> just a clue to what's going, going, going on as a mind up. Thought about the fact the fixed bootstrap at the bottom, configuration independent. The first thing it did was to load a configuration specific bootstrap out of the first block of the overlay file. That one loaded the rest of the lower data and the setup code and the setup code sat over the runtime areas that could read installation parameters from a card reader from the ops console. They could save them to disk. And it, it created and initialized all the dynamic upper areas. And the last thing it did was to allocate the multiple block areas, the way the installation premises had told it. And then it did the disappearing trick, pulling the rundown code down over its own head. And its last three instructions were go one hash at one hash idle, go two hash at two hash idle. Oh, look, I become zero hash. And the system was on the air. And then if you had to invoke, invoke a post-mortem because it had crashed or you wanted one anyway at the end of the session for tuning, again, the post-mortem code came in over the other code. And the first thing it would do was read all the fixed data. So it now knew where all these tables were, and it would, it would either print or write to disk comprehensive analysis of every buffer, every file record, every user table. You know, it could be that thick, but they're essential to find things. And there, up in, I've just used, used a bit of fancy color when I discovered how it worked. The, the multi hook areas, you can see, you, you could have a, th a th three area compiler in alongside a little utility, or you could have something medium. You could have a, a couple in and you could swap them about. And we only swapped as many areas as we needed. So if you had a three area compiler running and it and you wanted to time share it out, to run a new utility, you only needed to swap the one area out to disk. And then the, the other two areas could just stay there. And then you bring the missing bit back and it could carry on. So that was our technique. But Maximop system itself had to grow. Because if we wind back a bit. When we started Maximop, we had a nine channel multiplexer for 110 mode teletypes. And we had three 7151 monoscope VDUs, dreadful things they were. So we had a theoretical maximum, 12 simultaneous users. And we naively said, well, if we've only got 12 users, six bit characters got enormous redundancy in it for individual process IDs and so on. Great. And we optimized all our code for short tables, short queues mistake because soon the 5e had become a great big hundred and twenty eight k 4s twice the speed a 7903 front end processor with a hundred plus terminals on it all going at at least 300 bode so suddenly our little six bit process numbers were a restriction so that means you could only have 63 users on at once. And whilst you, we probably hadn't got enough to support 63 users doing real work, but if if they're only typing in a file at one character every two minutes, you don't that just isn't a big overhead. But immediately the what member two on the comms side <coughs> with its terminal numbers were going above 256 straight away. So we had to extend that field up, up to nine bits because 63 wouldn't do. 
But then as systems, not just ours, but in other universities got bigger and bigger computers with more and more terminals, the, the compilation configuration, remember two had all its tables for fast direct access in the lower memory. We started to you could compile it so it violated the 4K limit. Oops, that's no good. So we had a long debate about how much work it would be to move all member two's data tables into upper. But I, de I devised a clever trick with the compiler and I was able to do it. I won't go into details unless you really want to know, but I was able to do one huge, one huge systematic edit of the whole system <laughs> to move all the tables from lower memory to upper. And they all still, and 99% of the code did not need to be changed because I'd gone from being a table indexed by a terminal number to a block to pointer to a, to a block indexed by the offset within the block. I was able to just swap the two variables around throughout the whole system. And we only made, no, I only made one mistake in that edit. It turned out to be a cosmetic one that nobody noticed for 12 months. The only difference was there was an option which actually we never used at QMC, but you could you could set an option so that every user who logged in, their name was displayed to the operators, and when they logged out, it was displayed again. And instead of giving the terminal number, it gave the last three digits of the address of the terminal number. <laughs> I'd missed one instruction in the whole system, which I was very embarrassed about, but it actually was only a cosmetic problem. So that's Maximop. There is the original Maximop team. We still meet regularly. So there was Jeremy Brandon, who was originally the chief programmer. He was the design genius who designed it all. He had the ideas. He, he designed the three member model. He designed the umbrella file, all these fundamental architectural points that made it all work. There's me, I was taking the picture behind the camera. There'd be, be that's Bob Jones, who did mostly member zero and was subsequently known for things like fast, fast find and file sharing execs and things. There you see a lady called Sue, who was our the, the, the liaison officer, for whom we made excessive work because once we got Maxim up to run. Jeremy here, there, here, went to the next user group meeting and said, we've got Maximum running. Would anybody else like a tape? Expecting two or three other universities to ask. He came back with a list of, I think it was 32 mag tapes who had to get made and posted all over, all over the UK. And by the time we'd finished, there were over 147 sites worldwide. Mercifully, ICL took over the bulk distribution after that. Mm -hmm. Once they'd recognized that Minimop was dead and they simply we, 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 we drew it from the market and said, we will market Maximop instead. There'd be Jeff, who was the apps man. He could do wonderful things with large data sets off a semi-corrupt mag tape and things he could he could work the wonders like that there be dave who was another one of the geniuses he wrote all all the gin macros for us and some of them were very devious that we could we could use he designed all the overlay structure and all that stuff there be jerry who was actually one of the operators at the time. And there'll be John, who ran user services and advisory. And Steve, who replaced me as the, 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 the 
admin systems programmer. He actually did this ghastly thing called COVID. And I never got involved with. So that's the team. And as you see, we're all still going. Jeremy's not in the picture because he lives in Germany now. I'm going to say I was behind the camera. So end of lecture. There's, there's your homework. Go back and read the article I wrote in 2012, which I hope if you weren't an ICL aficionado, you might now understand. If you go to, to Brian's 1900 site, you can get a lot of information on the history, the 1900 emulators, and, and just about all of the ICL technical manuals, but they are in JVU format, which you have to download the right app to be able to decode, but they're very good. And of course, you can go up to the National Museum online or otherwise. And there we have running on a 2966 under direct machine environment emulation, a George 3 and Maximop system, which you can go and play with Maximop on a Sunday. You can normally get it there. Usually Saturdays. Oh, usually Saturday is it now? I mean, say it's interesting footnote that the success of Maximop and actually George II versus the George III all singing, all dancing, facilities rich environment, the ICL juiced, was that the, the, the smaller 2900 machines, the ones that were actually microprogrammed, actually ran with better performance if they put in the 1900 emulator called direct machine environment and ran and ran either George II or Maximop on them. And many, many commercial user sites did that to avoid ever changing their programs. And right to the very end, there were there were people who were still running. I suspect at least 50% of I, I don't know what what they called it. The is it the series for the the microprogrammable twenty nine hundreds? Actually, they never ran in virtual machine environment. They only ever ran in direct. No. Questions? Questions? Over to you, Dick. We've had a blizzard of discussion oh, on that. <laughs> in particular, John Cook has providers for the great deal of information, but no actual questions. Um, very well worthwhile scrolling up the chat and seeing what he has to say and various other people have to say and reply. Um, I have got one question here from Brian Shearing. Um, if Brian is still there, if you'd like to ask. Yes, yes, I'm here. Um, I wondered how you solve the control C problem. Uh, that is, the user tries to stop whatever's going on on their behalf at the time when their own personal program counters deep in the middle of some loop and you you uh, so who responded or which part of the system responded to the terminal attempt to escape uh, out of whatever was going on it's a well-known problem when writing a time sharing system particularly if you're using a higher level language which Jim was almost yeah yes it wasn't a problem in that sense we 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 were acutely aware of that issue to begin with and depending on what type of terminal you were using if we if 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 you were using a tele type your control c would come through maximum member two whatever else was going on it would arrive over the hardware or the front end processor would send it in and then we just simply reacted to it. We 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 had what was called the global breaking function. Oh. That as soon as oh. com system has said this user has issued a break in, then the program would immediately be suspended at its next time slot, and it would come back to the user and say, "Okay, you've broken in. So what do you want to do now?" And that worked regardless of the environment, be, because we were a trusted program, we could always stop the puck. In fact, not so much we could always stop it, we only allowed it to run for 
couple of milliseconds at a time before we 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 swapped it in and out and time shared it so unlike some environments that was fairly easy to to to, to deal with there okay thank you very much and don't forget to sign the petition to save the bbc singers everybody <laughs> very impressed at how you remember all this from 50 years ago it's almost as though you programmed it yesterday my program i can't raise it now. okay yeah. i seem to recall that there was a mop wasn't there as well as a mini mop and a mask. yes how did that relate to well the, um... that was the real-time part of george three oh. oh. and gave you basically from the mop terminal which you normally needed a vdu for rather than than teletype. From that, you could issue the the, the George three command language instructions interactively. So that came after Maximum. Yes, it came. It well, it was probably started in parallel mm. because the bit I didn't actually go into while we were cursing about the inefficiency of the mini mop system icl were actively developing george 3 mop yes it's actually part of, of the 5e contract that that's what it will be able to run after in the fullness of time and icl brought down george three tapes to run on our system because those days the universities got discount on the hardware by allowing icl to have every night shift for the first oh. 12 months and that sort of deal and we saw them actually running it and on the on the hardware we had mop was even slower than mini mop because it, it badly managed memory we decided and it insisted on telling the operators everything it was doing. And the ops console was 110 bow teletype. Mm. And the whole thing was completely IO bound. So that was actually going on in parallel, which we immediately said, that ain't going to go. You've got a lot of work to do, guys, before we'll swap over to it. And of course, we never did. And it's interesting that. I think some of the commercial sites and even a couple of the other the big 1906S universities, the wealthy ones up north, who ran George III as basically their batch system, they did, yeah. still ran, ran Maximop as their interactive system mm -hmm. because MOP was just, was just too resource hungry mm -hmm. for them. But we did. I said at the beginning, we said Maximop's got to do ex everything and exactly what Minimop does so we can swap over. If you read my article, you'll hear about how often we actually swap between one and the other and what, what the consequences of that were. But within a year, we knew we, 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 we would never run Minimop again. So now fast door compatibility no longer mattered. Oh. And it was very clear that all the other universities and a few commercial users who'd adopted Maximop, they, there was no chance of them ever going back. So at that point, we started to enhance some of the facilities and add extra subfile types that, uh, that Minimop did not understand. And we, Actually, because people started coming along with, with user programs written to, to exploit the, the, the George 3 extensions, additional peripheral track section types and so on, we started incorporating some of those in Maximum because they weren't very difficult to do. Because in that sense the, the framework turned out to almost surprise us with how flexible it was okay thank you 
if I might interject at this point, George 3, I think, was one example of the great tradition of ICL software being delivered very, very late. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Brian, you've got a couple of questions. You can unmute yourself. Uh, yes, thank you, Dick. Um, thank you, Arthur. Um, there was a Minimop 2 which allowed up to 63 terminals on an extended 7007 multiplexer. How well it performed, I have no idea. But certainly, George II Maximoff on a 1904A or 1904S would have given a better general performance than George III. You know, George III, with all of its enhanced facilities, required a lot of system to use. And in, and in answer to your why one, two, four, or eight block buckets, Depending on your, it, for systems programs, it wouldn't matter. Most systems programming use one block buckets. But when you're in applications programming, <clears throat> using records, if you've got a 64 word record, a one to eight word bucket with a two word bucket header means you can only get one record in a bucket with 62 words wasted. Yeah. If you go to a two block bucket, you can get three records and not so much wasted. So by juggling your bucket size according to your record size, you get more efficient disk usage, especially when you're down on EDS 4s, 8s. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Brian. Yes, yes, yes. That was a use of multi-block bits. That hadn't really occurred to me because, yes, you're right, it did make things slightly easier that way. We actually did use two-block buckets on the overlay file because... You notice the overlays were 256 words and that guaranteed exec couldn't do silly things and, and fragment the, the transfer if you made it a single bucket. But apart from that, you didn't. The yeah, multi-block buckets was more of an applications programming thing than uh, systems programming. Yeah, yeah well, indeed. Yeah. Um, I've got another question from Doran Swade. Unmute, please, Doran. Yep. Um, Arthur, one thanks very much. Um, uh, it's a while since I've done um, machine code programming. I'm reminded of the value of uh, head injury assessments after re-engaging in this sort of stuff. Uh, but thank you very much for reminding of what's involved. Um, I, there's been discussion amongst historians about the value of saving and archiving source code listings. And I was very struck by all the examples you gave of plan in that the comment field was very fully um, filled in to explain, to describe exactly what each code line meant. Was that for the benefit of this presentation and for us? Or is that actually a standard practice in, in all plan coding? It was a Queen Mary mandatory requirement of programming. We said for all the programs we, we wrote, that comments must be in full and every every segment we wrote both for maximop and for other utilities you you could have several pages effectively the spec as first block of comments so that the source code was effectively self-documenting and that we found to be a very powerful tool and certainly the Maximop system itself, it was how standard that every instruction must be commented and commented in a, in a meaningful way. We did have the odd bomb where a clever hard, a, a clever quirk of a couple of instructions were commented as exercise to reader. Mm -hmm. That was the exception. And we, we generally said, if you look at the, at the maximum source listing, which mercifully survived intact, it was one of the tapes that was found in the rectal archive. And we, 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 we think the tape that was found there of Maximop version 6A is, is the one that Stu labeled and sent to them with, with fully readable, so the whole system is saved. That was a great 
a boom to us because for maybe 20 years, we had all believed that the source code was completely lost. And all there were were some, were, were some compilation listings for various places. But of course, because we used all the hash skips to optimize the code, you got nowhere what's in the compilation listing is only the bits which were dependent on that configuration. <laughs> but mercifully, the whole source was, was, was found in the Brackle archive. So it lives forever now, I hope. I, I, I have a war story of comments that didn't quite match the code. The comment did what the code was meant to do, but the code didn't. Yeah. <laughs> it, yes. did. it eventually tweaked. Read the code, not the comment. Yes, yes, you, yes. you, you, you can be caught out like that. You, yes. you have to pay attention, and that's why we said they must be sensible comments yeah. that actually help you understand what the code's doing, rather than facetious comments like "can't fail," <laughs> an unhelpful comment on a conditional jump, because it always will. And again, the way we actually wrote Maximop. We, 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 we had a macro that generated a maximum system error, invoke the post-mortem. And anywhere you got to a can't happen condition, you, you, you put a maxi error in. You didn't allow it to fall through to the next bit of code, even though the team of six could not find a way it could ever, it, it, it could ever drop through. But we didn't. But I'm saying there were other slightly strange things we found compared with the Minimop implementation that trying to match the facilities, Minimop allowed you to write a macro in, in the man language and you could nest a macro in a macro, but only to one level. And when I came to write the macro processing overlays, Maximop member one, I couldn't spot an obvious way to make it so bloody restrictive. And you just keep recursing because the command line can only be 128 characters maximum, being the maximum IO transfer from any of the, of the terminal devices. So you don't need to bother. You just increment the counters, give it a register to count the the the, the depth width. You've 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 got eight million to go at. You can't get to eight million in a hundred twenty eight character line, even if if even if you 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 gave it a one character macro name and nested them solid for all for the entire line. You still only have recursed in level one two seven. And as, as, as you wouldn't fail crash or overflow, you know, at 8 million, why did you need to restrict it? I suspect that was something that the, the designers had written in as an ambitious implementation target. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if the programmers had to put code in, in to, to actually make it do that. But, so, yeah. I see David's got his hand up. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about commentary in um, saved um, source code. And uh, as you know, I've uh, saved quite a lot of Leo source code. And that is actually very richly supplied with comments. Um, so, but on the other hand, Code from uh, Kids Grove's um, KDF9 software can be extremely lacking in comments. And I once found the George 3 chapter with only one comment, which was so fatuous as to be unhelpful. I was told, however, of someone looking at OS 360 where they had a similar rule to, Q to QMC and the comment said, "Twas brillig and the slithy toes did gyre and gimble in the wave," and the uh, assembler was quite happy with that. I can beat that, David. I was once handed a Fortran program which was commented in Welsh, 
<laughs> Raphael, you put your hand up. You could unmute um, Ask us. Yes, thank you very much for the presentation. Very interesting. My, uh, I have a question about uh, George III and MOP. Uh, this was my introduction to interactive programming in the late 70s and early 80s when I lived in Krakow in Poland. Uh, that was on a Polish uh, replica of uh, ICL 1904 called Odra 1905. And uh, I wonder whether the comments you made about, uh, how shall I put it, the, the design and the style of programming of Minimop and MOP that followed uh, were similar, because uh, I distinctly remember that if MOP ran for more than 45 minutes without uh, uh, hanging up, uh, that was quite a miracle and a good day. And uh, I never understood, uh, you know, all those 40 years, whether the reason was MOP or was it a poor quality of the hardware that uh, Poland made when they copied the 1904? <laughs> I couldn't possibly comment on that. <laughs> it was, I would guess it was, it was half and half. Most of the problems we had in Maximop were usually timing problems. Mm. When you've got three threads cooperating in a very complex fashion, it's very easy to make a silly mistake that means something gets out of sync. Mm. And I know we spent years searching for the fact that Nearly every time we looked at the memory at close down, which we had an option to do, to, to, to take a short post-mortem every time the system was closed down, we discover that we had thrown away a data buffer. Hmm. And it took us years to find which bit of code was doing that because hmm. in theory, the process of thrown away a buffer, it should fail and crash and the user wouldn't like what happened. And nobody ever complained. And it was, it was a very silly thing. And it was a consequence of using zero to mean you haven't been allocated a buffer yet. So if you accidentally corrupted that zero pointer, all that happened was before you use the buffer, oh, I need to get one because it's still zero. And so the system was sort of self-healing in that sense operationally, but slowly wasted memory. And it took us years to find that. And we, it was interesting that several of the, because we'd been so systematic with the naming conventions and everything, that we fixed one notorious fault, which had brought us off the air about once a week for several, several months, which we regarded as a major, a major failure situation. We expected Maximop to run for rather longer than the hardware would. So about one crash a week was the most that was acceptable. We, we noticed a point of one thing a particular user was doing meant he was getting corruption of, of his register zero. We couldn't understand what could possibly be causing this. And we sat down with cups of coffee in the common room one morning and spent an hour and a half to brainstorm what the hell could this be, be about? Because we knew that when, when a user puck was swapped out of active memory, its registers went into word... 48 upwards on the fixed bootstrap. And it, clearly the program has been corrupted in word in absolute word 48 uh, system. But it's a very odd number. Why only word 48? And we racked our brains and we all sat around and said, there aren't any offsets as big as 48 in the whole system. And then we suddenly remembered there is one bit of the system, a thing called the puck control block, which was a place where we kept all the IO information about the current puck, did have offsets as big as 48. 
And then it only took a single compiler run overnight on source to find this systematically named variable, the one that had an offset value of 48. And sure enough, the Jin compiler had a wonderful feature called hash wrong. You could wrong a variable, which meant every time the compiler found it, it gave you an error W against it. So you could turn the listing down, the list level down to zero, and just say compile the whole system, hash wrong thread, and you'd only get a listing of all the occurrences of thread. And lo and behold, instantly, this particular variable, the J zero something, there was one that didn't have a modifier on the end of it. It was going to absolute 48 instead of dynamic 48 offset. That was the corruption, one word patch, and it was fixed. If you read my article, you know how we did most of the bug fixing online with dynamic mends without taking the system off the air while we did it, which which used to give our director heart failure. But we were confident enough, and I only remember crashing it once, and it was the problem that actually we'd only half diagnosed the problem. And we fixed the half we diagnosed, but that had a secondary effect on a bit we hadn't diagnosed. But usually it was something stupid, like there was one instruction wrong in that overlay. But we patch it because we we'd given ourselves comprehensive patching facilities from the operator's console where you, you could actually just alter words in the whole system. And it didn't matter whether it was in an overlay, in permanent code, in post-mortem code, in setup code. You could just patch it and you could, what we used to do was you'd put the patch, which would be one, two, three, four instructions, something usually. We'd, we'd, we'd put it into a macro with the, the right parameter on the end that said whether you actually wrote it back to disk or not, set to off. So you only patched it in the memory. You tested it, and doing the patch didn't bring the system down. You, you then actually tested the fault and it got through it and gave the right answer. Then you just run the macro again with the parameter saying right back. And hey presto, with no need to rebuild the system, the system overnight. It was right from now onwards. And we'd then put the, the compiler mend in, patch the source code and send it out as a user notice. All the, all the other sites. I think that's perhaps one closing comment, if I may. We we laughed about how widely Maximop eventually ran once ICL took over the distribution. We, I think, until the museum started to run it, I think the last running Maximop system we were aware of was the Institute of Technology in Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea, that was running a 2903 under DME, and we're still running it 10 years after I'd left QMC and got Logica, when I got a phone call from a site engineer asking me, me he, he somehow found me in the UK by, by networking or something. He, he found me with a technical question. I, I was gobsmacked that it was still running. And about, that must have been in the 1980s. Did you, did, were you able to answer it? Or can't you remember that part? I think I was able to reassure him that he probably only needed to recompile it and the problem would go away. Okay. <laughs> Something like, like, like that. Right. Um, one last question. Um, Tim Lyons, if you can be brief. Uh, yes, you said that uh, Member Nort uh, ran the user pucks, but you said that as soon as there was an uh, I.O. instruction or a console printout instruction, everything was completely suspended. Well, surely that meant that you weren't then able to switch to another puck to take advantage of the CPU time. Yes, you're right. 
because member zero got sus 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 suspended on, until exec had finished what it was doing with that. But that's the lesser evil. You maybe lose a time slot. That's all that usually happens. But all the users who are doing I.O. and using the built in editor or doing input or listing are totally unaffected by that in the other two members. So it's the, the lesser evil. We actually, to be honest, switched off most of the options to dis display things to the operators and so on because because they simply cost too much time. Yeah. Or we started doing them a different way. So we it didn't actually cause us to be sus sus suspended. You could do other things like because we we quite happily one of the utilities you could run under Maximop was to submit a file as a George II job. And that was completely watertight. It, it was entirely on disk and had no impact. So you could do it in a single time slot and nobody would actually notice. And a few minutes later, it would, it would pop up in the George to input. Yeah. So we did a, lo a lot of things by what we called the communications files. The fastest thing you could do was to write something to a disk and let somebody else read it back. Was, was far faster than trying to pass messages because they all got you hung up. So, every, but every time you wrote to the disk, it hung the program until the disk could actually. Uh, we used own monitoring and another little exec facility that originally only trusted programs, but later on, I think all programs, you could actually say to exec, just start this transfer. And I'll keep, I'll ask you if you find out the, when you finished it. Oh. So you didn't have to wait for exec to tell you it had finished. Yeah. You would see the busy status on the control block. And so you could just while test you could, that. You you could meanwhile, test you could carry yourself. on doing some execution of something else. Yes, yes indeed. Okay. okay. Arthur. <laughs> um, I, my duty today is to thank you, not just for this presentation, which has been absolutely splendid, and I think I've learned a lot, other people have as well, but also um, you'll know that I spent a few months of my career on Maximop, which set me up for about the next 15 years, uh, which I enjoyed immensely, so I, I'm incredibly grateful to you, um, and I'm sure that we all like to show our appreciation for this afternoon. Thank <laughs> yes, you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for, for, for putting up with both my bad cold and my stammer. I'm stuck with it, so that the rest of you have to be, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, I'll be sitting next to you. So. <laughs> okay, I think we're done. Thanks for coming, everyone.